This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning. Welcome to Cardiovascular Grand Rounds. Uh, this morning we'll have a talk from uh, Dr. Susmita Parashar. Uh, she's Associate uh, Professor in, in Cardiology. Uh, Susmita went to medical school in uh, New Delhi and then did her internal medicine training at the Medical College of Georgia. And then after that was an internist. I uh, was on faculty uh, at Emory and then decided to uh, do a cardiology training, which she did here and has uh, developed a, a career related to outcomes research and related to um, treatment of uh, women's health problems, uh, preventive cardiology, uh, and most recently, uh, has really helped develop the field of cardio-oncology. She's been on the steering committee for the uh, International Society of Cardio-Oncology and has been very active in developing guidelines, and we'll hear about that today. Sue Speed. Thank you, Dr. Smith, for the introduction. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for all of you for being here despite the cold and uh, dark, and it's 7.30, so welcome here. Um, so my topic today is I'm going to discuss st strategies to uh, minimize cardiotoxicity due to chemotherapy. The main objective of uh, my talk is to understand I'll help you understand cardiac implications of the following cancer treatments. I chose anthracycline, trastuzumab, and carfilzomib just because these are more prevalent and I see these more commonly in my clinic. Uh, and I want to review the recently uh, published strategies to minimize cardiotoxicity. And I, I feel like I hit a jackpot because all of these guidelines were published last week. So, um, so I had to revise my talk, but I'm happy to that these are all hot off the plate. So before I start, I want to start with a couple of questions. <clears throat> all of the following are risk factors for anthracycline-induced cardiomyopathy, except receipt of dexrazoxan, age more than 60 or less than 18, mediastinal radiation, black patients, and dose more than 300 milligram per meter square, of doxorubicin. So we don't have audience response system, so just shout it out. Huh? Hey. Hey, okay. Well, Dr. Smith is absolutely correct. So the, the answer is A, and we'll go over that. The second question is, all of the following statements um, are correct ex regarding trastuzumab induced cardiomyopathy except uh, this cardiomyopathy differs from anthracycline induced cardiomyopathy in that it is not dose dependent does not increase susceptibility to anthracycline cardiomyopathy, cardiotoxicity. Heart failure uh, improves in 75% of patients with ACE inhibitors and beta blockers, and is partially reversible upon stopping treatment. So what do you think? B or C? So the correct answer is B. So uh, it is incorrect. It does not. It does increase susceptibility to anthracycline cardiomyopathy. The objectives of my talk again is to understand cardiac implications of following treatment. So let's start with that objective. Before cancer is a success story, and the reason I'm giving this talk is because um, because cancer um, death rates have markedly decreased. So we can see that um, the mortality has def definitely decreased um, among um, patients with all kinds of cancer, mainly with uh, colon and rectum cancer, breast cancer here, and lung and bronchus cancer. So all of the mortality have decreased mainly due to the treatment um, that have been developed in ch chemotherapy and radiation therapy. The Hodgkin's lymphoma is an amazing success story, and you can see here in about 1970s when anthracyclines have, have been, were developed, the mortality rates have dropped significantly um, since then. 
What is important is to realize as that as the years have gone by, the death due to cancer related um, issues have been pretty stable. But if you look at the uh, curve in graph A, you can see that the CBD related mortality have substantially increased. I want to start with a case of a patient I saw last year. This was a 68 year old African American male with hypertension, stage four large B cell lymphoma. Echo was performed prior to our job therapy. This is a parasternal long axis view, and you can see that the EF is pretty nice and strong, about 55, 60%. This is apical four chamber view, and again, you can see the LVEF is about 55, 60%. So the chemotherapy in, uh, start, was started in June of 2015, which included anthracycline. The cumulative dose of adriamycin was 350 milligram per meter square. Um, in January of earlier this year, the patient was admitted with seizures and dyspnea. He was found to have new brain lesions an echocardiogram was performed. So this is the echocardiogram in January. As you can see, the EF is barely 5 to 10 percent in the same parasternal long axis view. This is short axis, and you can see here again that there's no significant regional wall motion abnormality, even though you can say the anterior wall is slightly um, here. You can see it little, looks a little bit down. And then this is the four-chamber view. Again, the EF is very low, and there's very significant mitral regurgitation. So we actually um, did a cardiac cath on this patient because of his age, and there was some question about the anterior wall, the hypokinesis, and cath was absolutely normal. So before we proceed with what happened in the case, I want to talk about how do anthracyclines work. So anthracyclines are natural product, which was derived from streptomyces. Um, it basically inhibits the DNA polymerases and DNA fragmentation so that the high, uh, very fast replicating cancer cells, basically they stop the replication and does the cancer. It also generates oxygen-free radicals which may be involved in anti-tumor effects as well as toxicity associated with these drugs. The cardiotoxicity is, uh, is very apparent in the um, electron microscope. You can see that this is a normal myocardial cell, and you can see the disarray that is seen in patients who have received anthracycline. There's a lot of vacuolization, as you can see here. And again, this is a normal myocardial cell that you can see when under after receiving anthracycline, there's a lot of vacuolization that ha ha occur here. The doxorubicin-induced heart failure increases with cumulative dose of doxorubicin. This is a very nice graph which shows probability of heart failure on y-axis and the dosage, cumulative dosage of adriamycin or any other anthracycline in meter, milligram per meter square. You can see that as the dose increases, the probability of heart failure significantly increases. The numbers, whenever I have given talks or I want to write it down, have been very um, variable in different literature, but I'm very pleased to, like I just said, these guidelines and these um, were published just um, last week on the 8th. And they have very, uh, and I've always had um, this issue with um, colleges where we have deferred in what is the prevalence or incidence of cardiotoxicity with anthracycline. You can see here about 3 to 5% of patients develop cardiomyopathy or cardiotoxicity at 400 milligram per meter square of anthracycline, which is the usual dosage. 7 to 26% of people develop cardiomyopathy after receiving anthracycline dosage of 550 millimeter square. And you can see here about 50% about of patients can get cardiotoxicity with cardio uh, with anthracycline dosage of 700 milligram per meter square. The incidence is lower when epiribicin and idaribicin are um, given. And as we'll discuss um, in the next few slides, if liposomal anthracyclines are given, the incidence is much lower as well. The risk factors of anthracycline cardiomyopathy are 
pre-existing cardiovascular risk factors such as hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and diabetes. Um, if a patient has pre-existing LV dysfunction because of whatever reason, they are more likely to develop cardiotoxicity. Extreme age, which is defined here, not by me, is age less than 18 years or more than 60 years, African-American race, dose more than 240 milligram per meter square of doxorubicin, combination chemo such as uh, trastuzumab, and receipt of radiation that involves the heart in the radiation field. Anthracycline cardiotoxicity is not just heart failure, it's a continuum. You can see here there may not be any cardiotoxicity. So as we saw, not everybody develops some cardiotoxicity due to anthracycline. There may be subclinical myocardial injury. There may be asymptomatic LV dysfunction, symptomatic heart failure, refractory heart failure or cardiogenic shock, or death in some patients. The cardiotoxicity has been finally, it has um, the, both the guidelines published by ASCO, American Society of Clinical Oncology, in association with ACC and AHA were published last week, as well as the European Society of Cardiology. And all of these societies have finally agreed that cardiotoxicity is defined as decrease in LVEF to absolute uh, value of more than 10% to a value below 50%. So if a patient has 65% baseline EF and now it's 55, that's not, that's not cardiotoxicity. It has to be less than 50. There are three types of cardiotoxicity according to the time of onset. There's acute onset, which I've seen in a couple of patients here in patient. After a single dose or a single uh, course of anthracycline, clinical, manifest uh, clinical manifestations are within two weeks. There can be early onset of less than one year. Commonest, this is a commonest phenomenon. It's a dose-dependent progressive decrease in LVEF. Patients usually pre present with dilated cardiomyopathy and heart failure. Late onset is also quite common, which happens, occurs more than one year after anthracycline, sometimes decades after anthracycline usage. This was a paper published by Dr. Cardinali from Milan, Italy. She's one of the pioneer uh, researchers on this in this area. You can see here that this is an uh, event-free patient um, survi uh, survival. Um, this is a time since end of chemotherapy. What was very interesting to me, and this is very different from previous data, is that most of the cases of uh, cardiomyopathy occur in the first year, so 98% of cardiomyopathy or cardiotoxicity actually occurred in first year in this patient population. She followed about 2,600 patients over about 10 years. So the next um, uh, chemotherapy agent is um, human epidermal growth factor receptor, HER2 receptor blocker. It is expressed in 25% of the breast tissue. Prior to HER2 therapies, Breast cancer had very poor prognosis and mortality was extremely high, more than 80%. Trastuzumab has improved survival in both adjuvant and metastatic HER2 breast cancer. However, and the mortality have been reduced by um, one third after trastuzumab use. Trastuzumab is a humanized monoclonal antibody which targets HER2 receptors. As you can see here, this is trastuzumab. It binds to HER2 uh, receptor here, and it basically promotes apoptosis of cancer cells. The problem is the incidence of LV dysfunction is 1.7 to 20 percent after trastuzumab, and about 17 percent of patients have to stop treatment due to LV dysfunction. The incidence of heart failure is highest when anthracycline and trastuzumab ha, um, are given together. In this graph, you can see here the, um, the cumulative incidence of heart failure. In patients who just receive anthracycline, the incidence is about 4%, as we discussed, with trastuzumab about 12%. And when both of these are given together, the incidence is 20%, which is huge considering the number of patients we treat with these therapies. So one in five will develop LV dysfunction. This was a patient I saw um, as, as, uh, last year again. This was a 56-year-old uh, woman with HER2 breast cancer, no cardiac risk, cardiac risk factors. She had lumpectomy and received anthracyclines. 
After that, she was scheduled for, to receive trastuzumab and paclitaxel for a year. Her baseline EF was 60%. At routine three-month echo, her EF was 45%. She did not have any clinical evidence of heart failure. So this patient was sent to me with a question, should the patient receive trastuzumab? What other treatments could she possibly get? So this was not a question for the audience. I'll just go to the recommendations. So if the patients are asymptomatic and the LVEF have decreased more than 10 points, which it had in this case, and baseline was less than 50%, the LVEF or echo should be repeated in about to three to six weeks. And if LV is improving or improves or normalized, uh, trastuzumab therapy can be resumed. The patients are also recommended to be started on ACE inhibitors and beta blockers in this time. The reason for this recommendation is something very interesting with trastuzumab. Um, there's significant reversibility of LV dysfunction with trastuzumab-related cardiac toxicity. You can see here, this is the EF about 60% uh, prior to trastuzumab. After receiving trastuzumab, the EF is about 45% or 40%. Um, note that after a few weeks, after receiving the, after the patient had received standard heart failure therapy, including ACE inhibitors and beta blockers, the EF has normalized. What is most interesting is the EF remains normal even after trastuzumab is given. So that's a blessing in the sense that we can give that to the rechallenge patients with this therapy. So the key differences between anthracycline and cardiotoxicity are summarized in this slide. Um, doxorubicin cardiotoxicity is type 1, whether trastuzumab is type 2. The um, doxorubicin toxicity results in cellular death, and damage starts with the first administration of uh, doxorubicin. Biopsy changes are very typical of anthracyclines, as we have seen. However, in trastuzumab, there have been no biopsy changes that have been um, um, uh, seen. The anthracycline toxicity is cumulative dose-related, as, as we just, uh, uh, just saw, whether, whereas trastuzumab is not cumulative dose-related. Um, type 1 is mostly rever uh, irreversible or permanent damage due to anthracycline, but trastuzumab prognosis is pretty good. It's quite reversible. Um, the risk factors, as we discussed, uh, for anthracyclines are age, prior cardiac disease, and hypertension. And for trastuzumab, it is use of anthracycline concomitantly age, previous cardiac disease, and obesity. Let's look at the mechanism of action of carfilzomib. It's a proteasome inhibitor. So basically, um, malignant plasma cells depend on proteasome function due to overproduced proteins, and um, carfilzomib causes loss of proteasome function that can induce cell death. Um, the mechanism of cardiac injury is um, largely unknown. However, the incidence of heart failure is extremely high. So about 11 to 25 percent of patients um, have cardiomyopathy due to car carfilzomib. It can also lead to restrictive cardiomyopathy, MI, ischemia, or cardiac arrest. The risk factors are, again, more than older age, more than 75 years. NYHA class 3 or 4 patients with heart failure have higher, ha, have higher incidence of cardiomyopathy. And patients who have had recent cardiovascular disease, such as ischemia or conduction abnormalities, angina, arrhythmias, have higher incidence of cardiomyopathy as well. This is a patient that I saw um, my first year or second year um, at, uh, as faculty here at, in cardiology. This was a 74-year-old male with multiple myeloma. It was diagnosed in 1993. The prognosis of, he had progression of disease despite treatment with chemo, interferons, dexamethasone, velcade, ravilamid, and unsuccessful stem cell collection. So carfilzomib was chosen, and dexamethasone carfilzomib was started in, in 2003, January. It was held in May due to heart failure, and carfilzomib was discontinued with normalization of LVEF. So I want to show you this case here. This was um, in December 2012, before the therapy was started. You can see the EF is pretty uh, normal. 
And during carfilzomib, mean, the EF has decreased quite substantially. I would probably give it about 25, 30% at the most in May. Again, the EF is quite low. So the question is, uh, as I just mentioned, carfilzomib was, carfilzomib was discontinued, but can we challenge this patient again with carfilzomib considering that it is reversible? So we decided the, uh, to not challenge this patient due to various other risk factors that this patient had and the age, as well as how symptomatic he became with heart failure and patient and his family's wishes. But the recommendation is that you can, like frastuzumab, we can monitor and evaluate patients for clinical signs of heart failure. We can withhold it if there is um, heart failure like we have seen in this patient. And this patient can be restarted on carfilzomib at a lower dose if that is the only option left. So amazingly, as you can see here, this is in July 2013, just two months after we stopped carfilzomib, the, his EF is pretty good. Um, a hyperdynamic, in fact. So I want to go to the second objective and review recently published strategies to minimize cardiotoxicity. So before last week, there were no specific guidelines, and whenever I had to present, there were just consensus statements from various different societies. But um, these two guidelines were published just last week, and I, I have placed, the, placed um, those here for your reference. Um, so one was published in Journal of Cardiac on, um, Clinical Oncology, and the other one was in uh, European Heart Journal and European Journal of Cardiac Failure. I want to use the diagram that the recommendation, the guidelines committee have used, and I want to go over this in just a little bit of uh, detail because I'll be using it throughout the talk. So they have um, defined survivors as patients right after cardiac cancer diagnosis toward, until the end of treatment. Um, the recommendations are based on when during the treatment or before or after the treatment um, um, do you use certain strategies. Recommendation one is based on evaluation throughout the cancer treatment of patients. Just evaluate them based on their risk factors, et cetera, that I'll go over. Strategy two is prevention before the start of treatment. There is, again, certain um, strategies we can use during treatment and certain after the treatment. So I'll go over that in detail. Recommendation, the first strategy is which cancer patients are at increased risk for developing cardiac dysfunction. So identification of high-risk patients are, um, are uh, basically clinically judged throughout the cancer therapy. Any treatment that includes high-dose doxorubicin of more than 250 milligram per meter square, high-dose radiation therapy of more than 30 gray, or lower-dose anthracycline with a radiation therapy are considered high-risk patients. So if they have received basically high-dose anthracycline radiation therapy or a combination of the two low-dose agents. If they have received low-dose anthracycline but have the following risk factors, they are considered high risk to develop cardiomyopathy. And these are more than two risk CVD risk factors, as we just saw in our patients, older age more than 60 years, or compromised cardiac function because of whatever reason. So this clinical assessment has to be carried out through, um, throughout the entire treatment of cancer patients. The second strategy is which preventative strategy minimizes risk before initiation of therapy. So can we do something before the patient starts um, cancer treatment to prevent cardiomyopathy? The first is we can avoid or minimize use of cardiotoxic therapies if alternative exists without compromising treatment. So if you identify a patient with, who are at high risk for developing cardiomyopathy, there should be a close co collaboration with oncologist, and it should be decided, should we use, the, is there any other agent which have similar efficacy and um, on mortality um, that we can, we can use for cancer treatment. Comprehensive assessment should be carried out, including uh, history, physical exam, and echocardiogram. 
Now, the uh, third recommendation is what strategy minimizes risk during potentially cardiotoxic therapy? The first recommendation is screen and treat for cardiovascular risk factors. We can use strategies to prevent cardiotoxicity by reducing potency of the medications we are using by giving dexrazoxan and ACE inhibitors beta blockers, and I'll go over these in detail. The first is screen and treat for cardiovascular risk factors. As you can see here, this is the um, development of heart failure, risk of development of heart failure with anthracycline. High blood pressure, patients with high blood pressure are 12 times at, um, at risk of developing cardiomyopathy. If somebody has high blood pressure and high cholesterol, they're 11 times more likely to develop cardiomyopathy. And patients with diabetes and hypertension are 17 times more likely to develop cardiomyopathy. What is unclear is if we treat these factors, can we prevent cardiomyopathy? That has not been shown yet. But in any case, these are some of the risk factors that we control in any, anybody and everybody. Um, so controlling these traditional risk factors in cardiac, in patients who are going to receive chemotherapy is very, very important. This is the graph of all cancer survivors um, by CVD status looking at their mortality. This is not just for cardiomyopathy patients, but I wanted to bring this to your attention because sometimes I feel that sometimes in cancer patients we forget about traditional risk factors and we feel like they're getting uh, treatment for cancer anyway, so why should we be too aggressive in controlling the other risk factors? You can see here that this is a graph showing cancer patients with um, cardiovascular um, risk factors. They, they have the highest mortality when compared with um, cancer patients without CVD risk factors. So controlling and treating traditional risk factors of cardiovascular disease is highly important. Reducing the cardiotoxic potency of cancer treatment is important. We can do this by continuous infusion. So um, uh, ACE the anthracycline concentration is higher in heart tissue with bolus and lower when we give continuous infusion. This is not just for um, anthracycline. We saw a patient um, last year who had coronary vasospasm with 5-FU. That was the only therapy that, uh, the pa that was um, um, basically the oncologist recommended and was left. And we recommended that the 5-FU be given as an infusion with nitro drip along with it to prevent coronary vasospasm. So continuous infusion is an option. 48 to 72 um, hour infusion is common in sarcoma and lymphoma patients. Sorry about that typo. Um, <clears throat> children have no cardioprotection with infusion. So this, uh, uh, my presentation is mainly for adult patients. The divided doses causes less damage than bolus. Drug-free interval between anthracycline and trastuzumab, if the, there's higher interval, there's less likely to be cardiomyopathy. Using a less toxic cardiotoxic toxic derivative such as epirubicin or idorubicin is helpful in preventing, preventing cardiomyopathy. Another cool agent that I, I thought uh, was liposomal doxorubicin. So this was active doxorubicin, which is trapped within the internal aqueous compartment, as you can see here. And this is restricted to the inside of the vessel wall. It does not, um, it readily pe penetrates the tumor vasculature, but interestingly does not penetrate the cardiac um, tissue. So thus the cardiomyopathy is much less when um, the liposomal doxorubicin are, is used. Dexrozaxin is the only FDA approved cardiotoxic, cardioprotective agent for adults. It diminishes tissue damage resulting from the extravasation of anthracycline. Reduces oxidative stress also, but largely the mechanism of cardioprotection is unknown um, in dexrazoxin. The third agent is what we are most familiar with as cardiologists, uh, with, uh, that include ACE inhibitors, ARB, and beta blockers. This was a small trial published in JAK in 2008. Um, about 50 patients with breast cancer and lymphoma were randomized equally in 25 and 25 into carvedilol and placebo groups. Carvedilol was started before anthracycline and was continued for six months. LVEF was measured at the end of six months. 
This is the carbidolol group, and you can see here that um, the LVEF has not changed much at all between um, the baseline and six months. In placebo group, however, the LVEF has decreased substantially. What I want to bring to your attention is that there are 50 patients. And as cardiologists, we are used to seeing 10,000 patients randomized to different drugs, so, which is not uh, really possible in these kind of uh, patient population. Nebivilol has also been shown to be cardioprotective. This was another trial, 45 patients. So I'm, I'm pretty, I was pretty intrigued at the N number. Um, with uh, breast cancer, patients were randomized into nevivilol or placebo before anthracycline was started. It was continued for six months, and LVEF was measured at the end of six months. Uh, what was found is that placebo lowered LVEF compared to, in the placebo group, the LV, LVEF was much lower compared to the nevivilol group, 58% um, versus 64%. The p-value was highly significant. These are some of the hot strategies. I call them hot because some the names are good, and also they were very recent. Last one published uh, last week. This is the Overcome trial. I was trying to figure out how it's called Overcome, and it's like pretty quite uh, interesting. But anyway, so uh, these are 90 patients uh, who were ran uh, who received anthracycline were randomized into two groups. The first group received enalapril and carvedilol and the second group received placebo. The LVEF was measured before and after chemo with um, um, MRI and echocardiogram, or echocardiogram. These are the results presented here. In an allopril and carvedilol group is here, control group is here. LVEF, the number of patients were 42 and 37. The baseline EF was pretty similar in both groups, about 62%. At six months, in enalapril and carvedilol group, the change in EF is quite low. And remember, we're looking at the lower the change, the better it is, right? We want to preserve the LVEF. So in the combination group, the EF change is much lower compared to the control group where the EF change is about 3%. Um, again, this was quite sign highly significant. And what is interesting, again, is these, uh, even though the N is very small, these trials are so important that they are published in um, important journals, cardiology journals, such as Jack. This is the Prada trial. I love this name. Um, so 130 patient, women with breast cancer with mean age of 51 years uh, who received anthracycline with or without trastuzumab and radiation were randomized into three groups now. One received candesartan, the second metoprolol, and the third placebo. Metoprolol group did not show any change, whereas candesartan group, the change in EF was much lower than the placebo group. Um, there was a lot of discussion about why did carvedilol and bisoprolol showed preservation of EF but not metoprolol. The, uh, the final, uh, what, what I, from what I can gather in the discussion, they are not sure whether this, these benefits are agent-specific or the, or the class-specific. It looks like they may be agent-specific at this time. So if you want to start anybody, any patients um, for cardioprotection, the recommendation is to choose carvedilol and bisoprolol at this time. Sometimes, though, my patients are not able to tolerate carvedilol at, or bisoprolol at all, especially if they are younger individuals and their blood pressure is 100 over 70. So in those patients, I, I have to, just to sneak some beta blocker in, I have to put them on toprolexel. Um, but like I said, the data in this particular um, clinical trial did not show any effect with metoprolol. This was the Manticore trial published uh, last week. In this trial, 99 women with HER2 breast cancer who were receiving trastuzumab were um, double-blind and placebo-controlled randomized into three groups, perindopril, bisoprolol, and placebo into one to one to one um, ratio. The, all the treatment was started before trastuzumab and continued during therapy for about a year. At the end, the change in LVEF was um, measured by the um, uh, 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 MRI. The results are presented here. I'll go over this table. This is LV, LVEF at baseline, 
cycle 4 and this is the change from baseline in red. After cycle 7, change in baseline in red. This is the placebo group, perindopril group and bisoprolol group. You can see here at the baseline the LVEF is pretty similar in all the groups. After cycle 1, the highest change was in placebo group about minus 7 and both the perindopril and bisoprolol group the change was about minus 4. Um, this was highly significant. After cycle 17, the changes again um, was uh, highest in placebo group, higher in perendropril and bisoprolol was the, low, the least change. So the, um, both of perendropril, which is an ACE inhibitor, this was a Canadian trial, so that was the ACE inhibitor used in Canada, and bisoprolol preserved EF in these patients. Bottom line on ACE inhibitors and ARB, um, as well as beta blockers in both the rec guidelines that came last week, is that there's no guideline on routine use of ACE beta blocker for prevention of chemotherapy induced cardiomyopathy at this time. So they have left it open that clinicians may use it, but they said that they don't have enough data to actually recommend um, that for prevention. Looking at the cost of these various strategies, I thought it was interesting to present this data to you. For continuous doxorubicin um, infusion, the cost is about $67. For liposomal doxorubicin, it's about $2,800. Um, Dexorazoxan is $362. And ACE inhibitor beta blocker, if you get that at Walmart or something, it's $4. So the cost is also very important when considering different strategies. The recommendation four is surveillance during treatment in patients at risk for cardiac dysfunction. So when patients are receiving these therapies, what can we do? What, how, frequent, uh, how frequently this, these patients should be surveyed or go under surveillance uh, to minimize cardiotoxicity? The recommendation is that these patients should have echo at baseline and at end of treatment. And I put a couple of asterisks there because I want to go over that in a little bit of a detail in the next few slides. For patients who are receiving higher dose of anthracycline regime and, and also have higher baseline risk, which I just presented to you, echo is recommended at the dose of 240 milligram per meter square. The 3D ejection fraction is the best. Most of the um, uh, clinic labs do not have 3D capabilities at this time, so the recommendation is to use 2D biplane Simpsons method. The ideal setting is to have serial measurements by the same observer using the same equipment. Echo may be used for surveillance in asymptomatic um, patients as well. The frequency was left to be determined by the clinicians. Um, there is a lot of data on uh, troponin and BNP, which I'm not presenting today, but um, these are to be considered at baseline. I want to present our paper that, we, that was published last year in BMJ. Uh, this was pattern of cardiac surveillance among patients with lymphoma who were receiving anthracycline-based chemotherapy. Um, the first author was Dr. Um, Olivia Hung, who is our cardiology fellow. Uh, we conducted a retrospective analysis in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma patients who received anthracyclines between the year 1995 and 2012. Uh, we, the cardiac function was evaluated by ECHO or MAGA, so we extracted data about that. The outcomes was cardi AC cardiomyopathy was defined as absolute decrease in LVEF of more than 10 percent to, uh, to lower than less than 50 percent. Quality of care was based on AS, ACC, AHA heart failure guidelines on AC inhibitors and beta blockers. We saw that only 34% of patients received both pre and post echocardiogram, which was pretty, pretty you know, only one third of these patients re, uh, got that. 30% um, of patients only got the pre chemo echocardiogram, only 4% uh, 4 received post chemo. And there was no echo documented in the charts in 32% of the patients. Among the patients who got LVEF measurement pre and post um, uh, anthracyclines, we found that 12% of patients had severe cardiomyopathy of less than 35% EF, and 50% patients had moderate cardiomyopathy with EF 35 to 45%. Only 47% of these patients 
received ACE inhibitors, 40% beta blockers, and only 40% of patients re re had repeat LVEF done. This is a graph showing mortality by cardiomyopathy, and you can see here patients uh, in red. This is atracycline-induced cardiomyopathy patients had much higher mortality than the other group. So that, just so that we don't think this is just an Emory issue, I want to present the data from Stanford. This was also published about the similar, um, a couple of years before our publication. Um, they also showed that about only 40% of patients, 51 beta blocker and 54% of patients had cardiology consultation. So we are, so this issue is uh, throughout the US which need to be improved. The last recommendation is what are the preferred surveillance monitoring approaches after treatment of patients at risk for cardiac dysfunction? Recommendation is to perform echocardiogram six to, six to 12 months after therapy. Cardiac MRI or MAGA should be used if echo is not available or suboptimal. No recommendations can be made for frequency and dura duration of surveillance. And um, actually, I personally was looking up to the committee making some uh, recommendation on how frequently these patients should have echo and for how long. So I see patients in my clinic who are survivors of childhood cancer. They, are, they, they had cancer and treatments when they were three, four years old or sometimes two months old. And they are thankfully now survivors. They're doing great. And they are continuing to get echo every year, or every two years, based on the pediatric guidelines. Um, I am asked every single day by somebody, one of the patients or their parents, how long will they keep getting echo? Or how, when would it end? And the, so I was really looking forward to some guideline about when can we stop that, or when, or when can we increase the interval. Um, unfortunately, the, the committee basically they had no data, so the, they, they actually stated that no recommendation can be made rather than leaving it open. So we are back to square one about this particular uh, question. What about ACE inhibitor and beta blocker after chemotherapy? Very, very interesting data presented by Dr. Cardinali in 2006. She randomized patients who, had, who received anthracycline and had troponin elevation after completion of anthracyclines into two groups. One group received enalapril and the other group received placebo. The, uh, in patients who, had, um, um, who received um, just placebo, 43% patients had LV dysfunction and 0% had LV dysfunction in ACE inhibitor group. Cardiac events was also very, very common in patients who received um, placebo. On all of these are listed here, and these are hard endpoints. ACE inhibitor group only had 2% cardiac events. Very interesting um, uh, graph. This is just to orient you. This is the LVEF on y-axis. Um, these are the months after therapy. This is before um, chemotherapy and chemotherapy and heart failure therapy is initiated. So as I just said, um, all of these patients were uh, started on heart failure therapy um, versus control group at about one month after completion of chemotherapy. And you can see here that most of these patients actually normalized LVEF by, the, by um, several months after starting ACE inhibitors. So the bottom line about ACE inhibitors and beta blockers after chemotherapy is that if the, there is LV decrease, the same numbers that I, that I presented before, I just wanted to reinforce this, reinforce this that the EF is more than, decreases more than 10% and less than 50% base number, the ACE inhibitors or beta blockers are recommended to prevent further LV dysfunction or development of symptomatic heart failure. And this is even... Uh, if the patient has asymptomatic, the recommendation is to start these treatments. So we have gone through both of these objectives um, to re understand the cardiac implication of these medications and review recent guidelines. And that concludes my talk. And I wanted to just showcase that we have a cardio-oncology program, which is on Winship website. If you um, want to look at that or your patients want to look at it, please refer them to this website. Thank you very much.
we have any questions? So, um, so I mean, my, my perception is that when I look at the trastuzumab versus the anthracyclines is that uh, the anthracyclines um, really are more likely to cause damage to the cells um, and that if this is in a pediatric patient that it may not be um, evident early on but that later as, uh, as these children get into young adulthood that we may be seeing problems whereas with the trastuzumab it, it my perception it's more of a um, cardiac depressant effect uh, that uh, if the patient can get through that period of heart failure uh, that they're uh, likely to have quite a bit of improvement we should be somewhat optimistic in, in treating those patients so I'd like your thoughts around that and then also um, it's been said that um, with the children that are followed long term uh, that often when um, when people would look back at their records that they would have uh, evidence of higher heart rates uh, than, than normal that that um, that, that seeing uh, the development of a heart rate of 90 100 in a in a young person uh, might be a clue that they have uh, cardiac toxicity and, and certainly looking for that um, other clinical things besides just echocardiography but I'd like your thoughts on that um, both of these are excellent um, points, Dr. Smith. So, yes, the anthracyclines have irreversible damage and actually um, causes DNA damage, and there's the damage that we saw on electron microscope. Um, however, sometimes these are the only therapies that are so effective that, you know, in pediatric world, we continue to use it at this time. In the future, maybe there would be some other therapies that can be used, but at this time, the, the benefits far exceed the risk. Uh, trastuzumab is a direct myocardial um, depressant, and uh, again, we are using these in heart, uh, patients with breast cancer. If the EF drops, we just wait for a few weeks, recheck the echocardiogram, and we can rechallenge these patients. The collaboration between cardiology and oncology is so critical in these patients because we need to start these patients very promptly on ACE inhibitors and beta blockers. Um, there are not that much uh, uh, downside to starting ACE inhibitor and beta blocker, in my opinion. We know these medications very, very well. These are commonly used. The side effects are known and uh, not very significant. And uh, these patients can, you know, if the e LVEF remains um, good after using these medications, trastuzumab can be used for about, um, for continued in these patients. And uh, they, I already showed you the mortality has decreased so much with trastuzumab that it is very, um, it becomes very important to work together to continue this medication with minimal interruption. The second question is really interesting about um, heart rate being high as a, uh, uh, as a first signal that something that these patients are at high risk of cardiotoxicity. We have seen these in adults, and actually I see these young adults in my clinic, and I'm just uh, impressed that their heart rate is 90s to 100s. Um, all the workup that I do are come back normal in the sense that they're not anemic, the thyroid panel is fine. And there's something about, I, I have not come across uh, many papers that actually tell you should we treat these patients uh, prophylactically if we see higher heart rate or if they have diastolic dysfunction or they have um, abnormal um, uh, echocardiogram strain. But these are really important questions to look at in the future. Um, uh, so the question is, how often do we uh, use dextrolaxin? Actually, in the United States, we don't use it as uh, much. The main reason for that is the FDA has um, approved it in the U.S. only for um, patients with uh, with uh, in adult patients, and second, only in certain kind of malignancy. Um, because there were some uh, data uh, previously that it may lead to secondary malignancy in children. So it has not been approved for children in the United States. However, in Canada and Europe, it's used much more uh, frequently and commonly um, um, than U.S.
and I'll be careful at making comments without data, but um, again, my perception in, in the patients who really get sick, um, who have uh, clinical heart failure with, um, with low ejections with, with the anthracyclines, um, they tend not to have very dilated ventricles and tend to have restrictive physiology. Um, and just one word of caution is in those sick patients, um, that, uh, that they often are, are less likely to tolerate ACE inhibitors when they're really sick, um, and likewise, less, less likely to tolerate beta blockers. So if we are treating them uh, with that, I would just, um, and I know some of this data comes out that's pushing towards that, uh, just a, a word, of, word of caution in the sick hospitalized patient um, that, uh, that, that these drugs can have adverse, adverse effects. So. Um, any other questions or comments? Sis Me, did you have any? Yes, thank um, you. No, again, um, thank you. This is a, I've just presented um, these cases uh, which for these three drugs, but just some, um, I see the, there are just so, several challenges when taking care of oncology patients because when they are receiving treatment acutely, they're very, very sick. So a lot of uh, therapies that Dr. Smith pointed out that we cannot use, like ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, they're so sick that and so hypotensive, especially after stem cell transplantation, that we cannot use these therapies. Um, so it's a completely different world, I feel, uh, when I ventured into oncology. Is, uh, like I tell them, it's like speaking in German. I just, it's just learning every day. It's a new thing. Um, just last week, just uh, it's not pertinent to our my presentation today, but um, last week I saw a patient who was um, uh, started on a new medication, and the question was that since this medication can cause increased um, uh, bleeding, should the patient continue Zeralto or not? And you know, I, I it was it, I looked up the data; there were none. So, what do you do in these cases? So, that, what my point is that close collaboration, just picking up the phone and talking to the oncologist is just the key. So if any, if you come out of anything from this, my talk, um, the most important thing is pick up the phone, call the oncologist, see what the prognosis is, what's the plan, are there any alternative treatments available? Because you don't want to pr protect the heart but the patient die of cancer in four months. So that doesn't make any sense. So that's the critical um, uh, part that I do all day is that uh, talking to the oncologist. Thank you for your attention. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.